Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App. Equity markets coming off the last week of the year, the best week of the year. Investors looking ahead to Friday when Fed Chair Jay Powell speaks and we get the core PCE deflator. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research writing this in the Financial Times. At this Nirvana level, all is right with the US economy because it is growing while inflation remains moderate. If the economy is doing well with the current level of interest rates, why lower them? Ed Yardeni, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. Ed, fantastic piece in the FT. Enjoyed reading over it when it came out a little bit earlier this morning. You say why mess with success. Can I get your base case? Do you think they will mess with success? Well, based on what I heard coming uh, in the presser, uh, the press conference that uh, Jay Powell had, it seems as though uh, he at least uh, is uh, continuing to... uh, tell us all that uh, they are probably are going to lower interest rates. Um, and uh, that kind of, ra- again, raises the question, uh, exactly why is that? I mean, we had a hot CPI and PPI uh, in a, a few days before his uh, press conference, and yet notwithstanding that, he expressed confidence that uh, all, all is well. Uh, and he, he's right about the economy. The economy is doing absolutely fine. Uh, I, I think there's uh, some Fed officials who believe uh, in the concept of real interest rates, that if uh, the inflation continues to come down, uh, then real, rate, real rates will be restrictive and that might cause a recession. So I, I'm concluding that the Fed put might actually be back. So if they do go forward and mess with success, given that you believe the Fed put is back, does it really matter? Is it equities up and up and up and away? No, it's 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 fine for the for the economy. I think inflation is still going to moderate, though. I think they're taking a chance here. Uh, with, with oil prices going up the way they have, uh, that's that's an area that can always spill over to the rest of the economy. So I I don't think they want to get get everybody thinking about the possibility of inflation coming back. But uh, yeah, I think. This is starting to possibly uh, be reminiscent of the 1990s. And if you ask me where we are in the 1990s, I think we're at December 5th, 1996, where uh, Alan Greenspan asked, how do we know if it's irrational exuberance? And I'm concerned that uh, the market uh, would go up too fast. Uh, I mean, it's it's great on the way up. Uh, Melt-ups are wonderful, but uh, by definition, they can lead to meltdowns. And so that's where my concern is. Look, I, I've been forecasting 5,400 by, by year end. I mean, we can get there by the end of the week, the, the way things are going. Well, but just to sort of sit a little bit, Ed, on what you were talking about with respect to commodities or oil prices, yeah. we've seen a number of strategists, Goldman Sachs coming out and seeing the potential for a 15% gain in raw materials over the duration of this year, in part because the Fed is going to allow growth to continue. Correct. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley also talking up the liking, uh, likelihood that a commodity-oriented cyclical boom really gets ignited. At what point does this become a problem for the broader market with the idea of inflation mm-hmm. coming back? Well, I'm not that worried about the inflation story because I think certainly on the good side, China is going to continue to export deflation. Uh, we continue to see that their producer price index is negative. We continue to see that uh, import prices uh, for the U.S. coming in from China, uh, those are negative on a year-over-year basis. Uh, China's in a pretty uh, serious uh, recession. Uh, They're really in a property depression, kind of similar to what happened in Japan a while ago and in the United States. And it takes years to offset or to come out of that kind of deflationary experience. So I'm not particularly worried about uh, price inflation. I'm more concerned about asset inflation. You know, it's not just the stock market that's on a tear. It's also gold, it's Bitcoin, uh, the the spread between uh, high yield uh, Corporate bonds and the treasuries is is extremely narrow. So that's where the Fed's running a risk here. I I think there should be three mandates. If they're going to have a mandate to keep inflation down, price inflation down, keep unemployment rate down, they also have to be concerned about financial stability. Ed, when you look at 
the take from Mohamed al and he told us on Friday it might not be this pinpoint when it comes to inflation. Maybe the Fed is now targeting a range. And he said last mm-hmm. week was a re- really good um, moment where potentially you saw that right. shift. Do you agree? Do you think the Fed is now looking at a range instead of 2 percent? Well, it seems more like they're, that based on what Powell said, that uh, their target is still 2 percent. They're not putting that in a, in a range. It's just uh, Powell kept saying over and over again uh, that uh, they're shooting for 2 percent over time, 2 percent over time. He said it several times. Uh, and uh, that implies that uh, they're willing to lower rates before they actually get to 2 percent, whereas the message before seemed to be that uh, they were, they're not going to lower rates until they're actually at 2 percent or so close to it and so comfortable that it's going to stay there uh, that uh, they can go ahead and, and, and ease. So I think the message right now is uh, pretty pretty ambiguous, quite, quite honestly. It does kind of make me wonder, you know, what do they know that I don't know? Uh, what, what's the rush to lower rates? The answer to that, Ed, is maybe nothing, as you know because they're often surprised Mm -hmm. by many things. And I just want to know, given everything you've said in the last five minutes or so, what are you advocating for in equity markets? What are you advocating for now from here Mm -hmm. to year end? Well, I'm still going to use 5,400. I mean, obviously we were only, you know, what, two, three percent away from that. Uh, but I'm, uh, I think it's still a bull market. I think uh, by, and next year we'll be looking at 6,000, maybe 6,500 by the, the year after that. So I think we're still in a bull market, and I, I think you stay invested. And so, if we get a melt up, uh, well, well, we'll have to discuss whether it's time to take some profits uh, before a meltdown. But that's, that's a risk scenario right now. It's not the most likely scenario. So where does the financial stability point come into play? How concerned are you about that? Well, I, I think uh, it's, it, it is kind of like the 1990s in that regard, but it's, it's not 1999. It's more like 1996. Uh, so we're, we're, we may be early on in the financial instability issue here, but things move pretty quickly these days. And everybody knows the history of the stock market. They know knows what happened in the 1990s. And uh, if the Fed really uh, you know, gives us a, a rate cut before we're expecting it, Uh, I think you'll see the market moving a lot higher. How much are you concerned about bonds waking up to the idea of something of a range, of the idea of stickier Mm -hmm. inflation? Right. Well, I think the bond market uh, is uh, happy to see the inflation coming down. Uh, And I think uh, the bond market is struggling the way all of us are with the Fed's message. What do they really want to do here? Uh, you know, the, the FOMC statement made it, made it sound like uh, we're, we're going to wait until we, we, we have the data that gives us confidence that inflation is coming down. And, and Powell modified that statement uh, by saying that, you know, things probably aren't going to work out in that direction. And this just sounds like extend the cycle, which raises a question about the cycle that I'd like your input on. Okay. Here, a lot of people come on this program and say we're late cycle. I think Lisa's asked the question a few times. Just how late are we actually, Ed, given the conversation we're having? Well, I think uh, we've we've discovered over the past couple of years that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And uh, you know, we we are, I think, just somewhere in the middle of the cycle. I don't think we're 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 late. I think the economy is still showing uh, plenty of signs that inflation is coming down. But you know, you have to put everything in a global context. It's not just uh, the, this the same old U.S. business cycle. It's You have to put it in the context of what's going on in China, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in the geopolitics. Ed Yardani, if you had any research, Ed, thank you, sir, giving us lots to think about. Stocks pausing on the back of another record week. We love doing shows for you. Fueled by the Fed's latest confirmation, we really do. It will cut sometime this year. With the market on track for its fifth consecutive month of gains. I'm speaking to management, not the audience. Neil Dutter of Ranmac, we love doing it for you too. Here's the quote. Neil, the market's rightly viewed the Fed decision as dovish, hence the rally in stocks and bonds. The risk is that January and February's inflation data represent a series of higher than expected inflation prints. Ultimately, Powell sees the stance of monetary policy as very restrictive. As a result... He's more on alert for downside surprises to growth than he is upside surprises to inflation. Neil, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. So, Neil, let's get into your framework. I remember a line of yours at the end of last year. I remember you sent me a message and you said the labour market is no longer a reason to be hawkish. 
And I thought it was really important at the time because it wasn't just that the labour market was somehow weakening or deteriorating. It was that even with labour market strength, even with economic growth, that was no longer a reason per se to be hawkish. Now, can you just walk us through how you're thinking about the economy with that in mind? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John, for having me on. Well, you know, compensation growth equals inflation plus productivity. OK, and uh, we know that compensation growth is moderating. You know, there's a lot of focus, of course, on wages uh, because that's the monthly data. But, you know, remember that benefits are slowing a lot more rapidly than uh, wages and salaries. And in theory, workers bargain over their entire compensation package. And when you look at quits, Quits are basically below where they were just before the pandemic, and it suggests that uh, broad measures of compensation growth, like the employment cost index, will be you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 3% by the end of the first quarter. Now, if you have 3% compensation growth, and we know that productivity is normalizing to around 1.5%, where is the inflation coming from? So if compensation is 3, maybe 3.5, and, and productivity is around 1.5, then you're at the Fed's underlying inflation objective of two. So there's a lot of focus right now on things like goods prices, producer prices. You know, as I mentioned last time I was on the program, Lisa's very focused on chocolate prices. Very. But, <laughs> but there's, there's limited pass-through from those things into core consumer prices. And um, I do think that the, the normalization of labor market conditions will take a lot of the pressure off of services, which are running, you know, well above what they normally run above with respect to goods prices. Now, one take that we heard last week repeatedly, I think across the street, including from yourself, was that the Fed was embracing the supply side narrative. Could you briefly describe that a little bit more broadly and help me understand, how do you set monetary policy when it's the supply side doing all the work? Well, I mean, I think first it's important to understand why um, the supply side looks better. I think that's primarily a function of normalization dynamics uh, following the pandemic. So, you know, this time last year, labor productivity growth was deeply negative, and now it's normalizing. Uh, that that's that essentially raises the speed limit for the economy. So, if you have uh, stronger economic growth, as Powell mentioned, I mean, you could have stronger employment and economic growth without necessarily pushing inflation higher. Uh, and I think that's why it's important. It gives the Fed room uh, to kind of uh, recalibrate policy. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that, and that's why it's important. Um, you know, so productivity's up. Um, that gives the Fed a little bit more, uh, more space to, to, to ease, uh, you know, modestly if inflation's slowing more quickly. Neil, I'm having a hard time, and I'm having a hard time for a number of reasons, partly because it's very hard to find people who can really pose some sort of negative case. But there is one to be made with the data that is coming in hotter than expected in certain areas. You talk about the fact that it, it, wage inflation seems to be nowhere. The New York Fed has a new measure of trend wage inflation that Torsten Slock put out this morning, saying that it's currently running at 5% and looking pretty sticky. Other measures showing that inflation is reaccelerating, uh, with Jim Bianco saying this no landing is going to pose a real problem for bond markets. How do you dismiss those things out of turn and retain faith in the disinflation story? Well, you have to go to first principles. I mean, I, I'm not a big believer in indicator macro. I don't like going and saying, look at this indicator. See, you know, it's up. Well, I mean, that's again, yeah, as I mentioned before, I mean, looking at the wage number, that's one thing. But people bargain over their entire compensation. Right. I mean, that's just uh, to me, that's a red herring to distract people from the best measure of compensation growth, which is the employment cost index, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, there's minimal pass-through from, from goods into, uh, into, into, into core consumer prices. But as I mentioned, first principles. Where is the acceleration in household and corporate measures of inflation expectations? Where is this showing up in earnings calls? Where? I mean, Costco's talking about uh, basically holding the line on prices. Walmart's talking about bringing their rollback back. So, I mean, if, if, if households expect inflation to basically be, uh, you know, I mean, th those expectations have been coming down in the last few months, uh, it would suggest that, um, you know, the inflation upside surprises that we've seen in the realized data will be fleeting. Well, but uh, I'd, also point out, I'd also point out, Lisa, that... Inflation data has been generally on the weaker side of the consensus overseas. Interesting. 
Um, it would support the idea that I think the Fed is putting a lot of currency into, I think rightly, that, um, that residual seasonality is a big driver of why the inflation numbers looked a little bit worse in January and February. Then, Neil, if that's the case, do you reject this idea of a reacceleration of the economy in some sort of material way and a broadening out around the world and say that that's premature because there is more weakness under the hood and, frankly, challenges to certain businesses that don't have the pricing power that would suggest that the Fed was justified in cutting now? I think, to me, the strength of the economy, that's a reason to expect a ceiling on how many cuts the Fed can deliver. It's not a reason for the Fed not to cut, cut at all. I think, I think part of this is we're, we're all very used to the Fed cutting a lot or not at all, because primarily it's, you know, they're, they're cutting aggressively to stop a recession from gaining hold or they're, you know, they're already too late and that's why you're in a recession, you have to cut a lot. What I'm talking about is just a recalibration of policy. It's difficult to see the Fed cutting six, seven times because, as you mentioned, the economy is strong. But if inflation is falling, they can at least adjust policy a little bit to kind of reset the economy. This isn't a outright easing. It's just simply taking policy from significantly restrictive to maybe a little bit less restrictive. That's all. I mean, this isn't like a broad wholesale change. I think that's kind of um, the sort of... Uh, thing that people are getting, I think, in my view, confused by. This isn't a wholesale change of policy. It's simply a recalibration of, of monetary conditions. And Neil, I'd like to finish there because I think those words are really important. Just how bullish the reaction function of the Federal Reserve actually is because many people ran away with the idea that it was super, super bullish. Neil, I just wonder how close we actually were to having a very different conversation. If that median dot had shifted from three cuts to two and it was very close to doing so, do you think the conversation would have been very different after the Fed meeting Wednesday? Not really, because what would have happened? My sense is that the bond market, I mean, the markets probably would have sold off a little bit. Um, I mean, certainly the expectation going into that meeting, John, was that, you know, we were kind of gravitating. The risk was for, for two cuts instead of three. Um, and maybe if they penciled in two, the markets would have taken that and, um, and sold off a little bit. You would have seen a modest tightening of financial conditions. But then guess what? Chair Powell would have come out, struck the same dovish tone, and then markets would have rallied. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the big story is they're cutting. They're just not cutting as aggressively. I mean, the strong growth in the economy puts a floor or, sorry, a ceiling under how many cuts they can do. And that's also in the dots. That's in the, that's in the outlook for 25 and 26. Got it. Neil, great to catch up. Got to do it again soon. Neil Dutta there of Renmac on the latest in the economy and on the Federal Reserve as well, Bramo. Following a series of dovish central bank meetings, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research saying this, the Fed cannot randomly pick some day and cut rates. If they do, and the market thinks it is not serious about inflation, sell bonds. Fed dovishness only works if the market is convinced inflation is not a problem. Right now, it's unsure. Jim joins us now for more. Jim, are you unsure? Yeah, I am. I mean, if you look at the markets, we've got the so-called everything rally. Except one thing has not been rallying with the everything rally, and that's been the bond market. It has been kind of meandering unchanged, especially if you go back to before the uh, Fed meeting. It hears the Fed wants to cut rates. It looks at the data. It sees stronger data, higher inflation expectations. It also sees the Fed upgrading its inflation and economic growth forecasts. And I think it's wondering is this a good idea for the Fed to be cutting rates? Because if they're not careful, they could cut rates. And if the bond market's thinking that they're unserious about inflation, we could wind up with higher yields, not lower yields. I think that's what we saw last summer. When the Fed stopped raising rates on July 26th, the market was worried it was unserious about inflation. We were at 390 on the 10-year note. 90 days later, we were over 5% before it started to really believe that the inflation numbers were coming down. You said last year that disinflation was transitory. Jim, you said that. You came out very early on and said it. I wonder, Jim, what you saw at the time that led you to believe so. Just looking at the data, you're right. I mean, I was looking at headline CPI, and it has bottomed June of 2023 at 3%. And if you look at the data going forward from here, especially the March data should be very strong, and you're probably not going to be below 3% until the fall, if, if not the earliest, unless price of crude oil collapses down to $50. Then you'll get there. 
But short of that, you're not going to be below 3%. And what I saw was just that the, the housing data was staying stickier than everybody thought. The wage data was staying stickier than everybody thought. And in oil and energy prices, which matters for headline CPI, was also not really declining to the extreme that everybody wants. And I think that's still the case as we move forward. When is it going to be something that the bond market wakes up to? Because right now it hasn't been material sell-off. And frankly, bonds have handled this pretty well. Yeah, they've handled it well, you know, over the last couple of weeks, which I've said it's been unsure. But, of course, the 10-year yield started the year 388, so it's up about 40 basis points for the year as we end the first quarter. Uh, the other problem or the other issue in the bond market is everybody's bullish. Everybody thinks that bond Bloomberg had a story basically about, you know, we're back in the curve steepening trade again. Everybody's losing money in that trade. But don't worry, it's going to be a good trade to wind up making. And that's really what the bond market is dealing with is a lot of bullishness right now, but data that is not supporting it. So it's going to take some time, and I think if the data continues to come in stronger than expected and the inflation data stays hotter than expected, the bond market will eventually turn towards higher yields. Well, this is really something that we were talking about with Sanal Desai, and she said that she still likes duration, actually. And the reason why is just because of the wall of money. And it's clear that there's so much liquidity in the system that's got to go somewhere, and the ball of money is just going into every risk asset as well as bonds. How do you argue against that, that that's not going to persist? Well, it is going to persist until the wall of money ends. And really, the biggest driver of that wall of money has been central bank policy. Now, I know they're doing QT, but they're also having their reverse repo facility roll off. I know this is a bit wonky. That's money that's outside the financial system that's getting pushed into the financial system that is creating more liquidity. That's within a couple of weeks to a month of ending. And then all of a sudden, I think the liquidity situation in the bond market or in financial markets generally is going to start to turn lower. And that wall of money is really going towards where it's treated the best, and that's cash. It's, you know, we've seen a trillion and a half dollars go into money market funds, and they just keep booming to new highs. And why shouldn't they? They're the highest point in the yield curve. And that forward-looking thinker, Tom Keene, has now got a quadruple levered cash fund. <laughs> and so I think he's got the right idea when it comes to where you should be. That's right. He had his European tour last week celebrating. Jim Bianco <laughs> of Bianco Research. Jim, it's good to catch up, buddy. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.